Chapter One of The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit as Revealed in the Scriptures and in Personal Experience by R. A. Torrey. Chapter One The Personality of the Holy Spirit. Before one can correctly understand the work of the Holy Spirit, he must first of all know the Spirit himself. A frequent source of error and fanaticism about the work of the Holy Spirit is the attempt to study and understand his work without first of all coming to know him as a person. It is of the highest importance from the standpoint of worship that we decide whether the Holy Spirit is a divine person worthy to receive our adoration, our faith, our love, and our entire surrender to himself, or whether it is simply an influence emanating from God, or a power, or an illumination that God imparts to us. If the Holy Spirit is a person, and a divine person, and we do not know him as such, then we are robbing a divine being of the worship, and the faith, and the love, and the surrender to himself, which are his due it is also of the highest importance from the practical standpoint that we decide whether the holy spirit is merely some mysterious and wonderful power that we in our weakness and ignorance are somehow to get hold of and use or whether the holy spirit is a real person infinitely holy infinitely wise infinitely mighty and infinitely tender who is to get hold of and use us the former conception is utterly heathenish not essentially different from the thought of the african fetish worshipper who has his god whom he uses the latter conception is sublime and christian if we think of the holy spirit as so many do as merely a power or influence our constant thought will be how can i get more of the holy spirit but if we think of him in the biblical way as a divine person our thought will rather be how can the holy spirit have more of me the conception of the Holy Spirit as a divine influence or power that we are somehow to get hold of and use leads to self-exaltation and self-sufficiency. One who so thinks of the Holy Spirit, and who at the same time imagines that he has received the Holy Spirit, will almost inevitably be full of spiritual pride and strut about as if he belonged to some superior order of Christians. One frequently hears such persons say, I am a Holy Ghost man or I am a Holy Ghost woman. But if we once grasp the thought that the Holy Spirit is a divine person of infinite majesty, glory, and holiness, and power, who in marvelous condescension has come into our hearts to make his abode there, and take possession of our lives, and make use of them, it will put us in the dust, and keep us in the dust. I can think of no thought more humbling, or more overwhelming, than the thought that a person of divine majesty and glory dwells in my heart and is ready to use even me. It is of the highest importance from the standpoint of experience that we know the Holy Spirit as a person. Thousands and tens of thousands of men and women can testify to the blessing that has come into their own lives as they have come to know the Holy Spirit, not merely as a gracious influence, emanating, it is true, from God, but as a real person just as real as jesus christ himself an ever-present loving friend and mighty helper who is not only always by their side but dwells in their heart every day and every hour and who is ready to undertake for them in every emergency of life thousands of ministers christian workers and christians in the humblest spheres of life have spoken to me or written to me of the complete transformation of their christian experience that came to them when they grasped the thought, not merely in a theological, but in an experimental way, that the Holy Spirit was a person, and consequently came to know him. There are at least four distinct lines of proof in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is a person. 1. All the distinctive characteristics of personality are ascribed to the Holy Spirit in the Bible. What are the distinctive characteristics, or marks, of personality? knowledge, feeling or emotion, and will. 
any entity that thinks and feels and wills is a person when we say that the holy spirit is a person there are those who understand us to mean that the holy spirit has hands and feet and eyes and ears and mouth and so on but these are not the characteristics of personality but of corporality all of these characteristics or marks of personality are repeatedly ascribed to the holy spirit in the old and new testaments we read in first corinthians chapter two verse ten and eleven but god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man which is in him even so the things of god knoweth no man but the spirit of god here knowledge is ascribed to the holy spirit we are clearly taught that the holy spirit is not merely an influence that illuminates our minds to comprehend the truth but a being who himself knows the truth in first corinthians chapter twelve verse eleven we read but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will here will is ascribed to the spirit and we are taught that the holy spirit is not a power that we get hold of and use according to our own will but a person of sovereign majesty who uses us according to his will this distinction is of fundamental importance in our getting into right relations with the holy spirit it is at this very point that many honest seekers after power and efficiency in service go astray they are reaching out after and struggling to get possession of some mysterious and mighty power that they can make use of it in their work according to their own will they will never get possession of the power they seek until they come to recognize that there is not some divine power for them to get hold of and use in their blindness and ignorance but that there is a person infinitely wise as well as infinitely mighty who is willing to take possession of them and use them according to his own perfect will when we stop to think of it we must rejoice that there is no divine power that being so ignorant as we are so liable to err to get hold of and use how appalling might be the results if there were but what a holy joy must come into our hearts when we grasp the thought that there is a divine person one who never errs who is willing to take possession of us and impart to us such gifts as he sees best and to use us according to his wise and loving will we read in romans chapter eight verse twenty seven and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of god in this passage mind is ascribed to the holy spirit the greek word translated mind is a comprehensive word including the ideas of thought feeling and purpose it is the same that is used in romans chapter eight verse seven where we read that the carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god neither indeed can be so then in this passage we have all the distinctive marks of personality ascribed to the holy spirit we find the personality of the holy spirit brought out in a most touching and suggestive way in romans chapter fifteen verse thirty now i beseech you brethren for the lord jesus christ's sake and for the love of the spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to god for me here we have love ascribed to the holy spirit the reader would do well to stop and ponder these five words the love of the spirit we dwell often upon the love of god the father it is the subject of our daily and constant thought we dwell often upon the love of jesus christ the son who would think of calling himself a christian who passed a day without meditating on the love of his saviour but how often have we meditated upon the love of the spirit each day of our lives if we are living as christians ought we kneel down in the presence of god the father and look up into his face and say i thank thee father for thy great love that led thee to give thine only begotten son to die upon the cross of calvary for me each day of our lives we also look up into the face of our lord and saviour jesus christ and say o oh, thou glorious lord and saviour jesus thou son of god i thank thee for thy great love that led thee not to count it a thing to be grasped to be on equality with god but to empty thyself and forsaking all the glory of heaven come down to earth with all its shame and to take my sins upon thyself and die in my place upon the cross of calvary 
but how often do we kneel and say to the holy spirit o oh, thou eternal and infinite spirit of god i thank thee for thy great love that led thee to come into this world of sin and darkness and to seek me out and to follow me so patiently until thou didst bring me to see my utter ruin and need of a saviour and to reveal to me my lord and saviour jesus christ as just the saviour whom i need yet we owe our salvation just as truly to the love of the spirit as we do to the love of the father and the love of the son if it had not been for the love of god the father looking down upon me in my utter ruin and providing a perfect atonement for me in the death of his own son on the cross of calvary i would have been in hell to-day if it had not been for the love of jesus christ the eternal word of god looking upon me in my utter ruin and in obedience to the father putting aside all the glory of heaven for all the shame of earth and taking my place the place of the curse upon the cross of calvary and pouring out his life utterly for me i would have been in hell to-day but if it had not been for the love of the holy spirit sent by the father in answer to the prayer of the son john chapter fourteen verse sixteen leading him to seek me out in my utter blindness and ruin and to follow me day after day week after week and year after year while i persistently turned a deaf ear to his pleadings following me through paths of sin where it must have been agony for that holy one to go until at last i listened and he opened my eyes to see my utter ruin and then revealed jesus to me as the saviour that would meet my every need and then enabled me to receive jesus as my own saviour if it had not been for this patient long-suffering never tiring infinitely tender love of the holy spirit i would have been in hell to-day oh the holy spirit is not merely an influence or a power or an illumination but is a person just as real as god the father or jesus christ his son the personality of the holy spirit comes out in the old testament as truly as in the new for we read in nehemiah chapter nine verse twenty thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth and gavest them water for thy thirst here both intelligence and goodness are ascribed to the holy spirit there are some who tell us that while it is true the personality of the holy spirit is found in the new testament it is not found in the old but it is certainly found in this passage as a matter of course the doctrine of the personality of the holy spirit is not as fully developed in the old testament as in the new but the doctrine is there there is perhaps no passage in the entire bible in which the personality of the holy spirit comes out more tenderly and touchingly than in ephesians chapter four verse thirty and grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption here grief is ascribed to the holy spirit the holy spirit is not a blind impersonal influence or power that comes into our lives to illuminate sanctify and empower them no he is immeasurably more than that he is a holy person who comes to dwell in our hearts one who sees clearly every act we perform every word we speak every thought we entertain even the most fleeting fancy that is allowed to pass through our minds and if there is anything in act or word or deed that is impure unholy unkind selfish mean petty or untrue this infinitely holy one is deeply grieved by it i know of no thought that will help one more than this to lead a holy life and to walk softly in the presence of the holy one how often a young man is kept back from yielding to the temptations that surround young manhood by the thought that if he should yield to the temptation that now assails him his holy mother might hear of it and would be grieved by it beyond expression how often some young man has had his hand upon the door of some place of sin that he is about to enter and the thought has come to him if i should enter there my mother might hear of it and it would nearly kill her and he has turned his back upon that door and gone away to lead a pure life that he might not grieve his mother but there is one who is holier than any mother one who is more sensitive against sin than the purest woman who ever walked this earth and who loves us even as no mother ever loved and this one dwells in our hearts if we are really christians and he sees every act we do by day or under cover of night he hears every word we utter in public or in private he sees every thought we entertain he beholds every fancy and imagination that is permitted 
even a momentary lodgment in our mind and if there is anything unholy impure selfish mean petty unkind harsh unjust or in any wise evil in act or word or thought or fancy he is grieved by it if we will allow those words grieve not the holy spirit of god to sink into our hearts and become the motto of our lives they will keep us from many a sin how often some thought or fancy has knocked for an entrance into my own mind and was about to find entertainment when the thought has come the holy spirit sees that thought and will be grieved by it and that thought has gone two many acts that only a person can perform are ascribed to the holy spirit if we deny the personality of the holy spirit many passages of scripture become meaningless and absurd for example we read in first corinthians chapter two verse ten but god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god this passage sets before us the holy spirit not merely as an illumination whereby we are enabled to grasp the deep things of god but a person who himself searches the deep things of god and then reveals to us the precious discoveries which he has made we read in revelation chapter two verse seven he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh will i give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god here the holy spirit is set before us not merely as an impersonal enlightenment that comes to our mind but a person who speaks and out of the depths of his own wisdom whispers into the ear of his listening servant the precious truth of god in galatians chapter four verse six we read and because ye are sons god hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying abba father here the holy spirit is represented as crying out in the heart of the individual believer not merely a divine influence producing in our own hearts the assurance of our sonship but one who cries out in our hearts who bears witness together with our spirit that we are sons of god see also romans chapter 8 verse 16 the holy spirit is also represented in the scripture as one who prays we read in romans chapter 8 verse 26 revised version and in like manner the spirit also helpeth our infirmity for we know not how to pray as we ought but the spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered it is plain from this passage that the holy spirit is not merely an influence that moves us to pray not merely an illumination that teaches us how to pray but a person who himself prays in and through us there is wondrous comfort in the thought that every true believer has two divine persons praying for him jesus christ the son who was once upon this earth who knows all about our temptations who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and who is now ascended to the right hand of the father and in that place of authority and power ever lives to make intercession for us hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 first john chapter 2 verse 1 and another person just as divine as he who walks by our side each day yes who dwells in the innermost depths of our being and knows our needs even as we do not know them ourselves and from these depths makes intercession to the father for us the position of the believer is indeed one of perfect security with these two divine persons praying for him we read again in john chapter 15 verse 26 but when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceedeth from the father he shall testify of me here the holy spirit is set before us as a person who gives his testimony to jesus christ not merely as an illumination that enables the believer to testify of christ but a person who himself testifies and a clear distinction is drawn in this and the following verse between the testimony of the holy spirit and the testimony of the believers to whom he has borne his witness for we read in the next verse and ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning so there are two witnesses the holy spirit bearing witness to the believer and the believer bearing witness to the world the holy spirit is also spoken of as a teacher we read in john chapter 16 verse 26 but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you and in a similar way 
we read in john chapter sixteen verses twelve to fourteen i have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now howbeit when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that he shall speak and he will show you things to come he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you and in the old testament nehemiah chapter nine verse twenty thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them in all these passages it is perfectly clear that the holy spirit is not a mere illumination that enables us to apprehend the truth but a person who comes to teach us day by day the truth of god it is the privilege of the humblest believer in jesus christ not merely to have his mind illumined to comprehend the truth of god but to have a divine teacher to daily teach him the truth he needs to know confer first john chapter two verses twenty and twenty seven the holy spirit is also represented as the leader and guide of the children of god we read in romans chapter eight verse fourteen for as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god he is not merely an influence that enables us to see the way that god would have us go nor merely a power that gives us strength to go that way but a person who takes us by the hand and gently leads us on the paths in which god would have us walk the holy spirit is also represented as a person who has authority to command men in their service of jesus christ we read of the apostle paul and his companions in acts chapter sixteen verses six and seven now when they had gone throughout phrygia and the region of galatia and were forbidden of the holy ghost to preach the word in asia after they were come to mysia they essayed to go to bithynia but the spirit suffered them not here it is a person who takes the direction of the conduct of paul and his companions and a person whose authority they recognized and to whom they instantly submit further still than this the holy spirit is represented as the one who is the supreme authority in the church who calls men to work and appoints them to office we read in acts chapter thirteen verse two as they ministered to the lord and fasted the holy ghost said separate me barnabas and saul for the work whereunto i have called them and in acts chapter twenty verse twenty eight take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the holy ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of god which he hath purchased with his own blood there can be no doubt to a candid seeker after truth that it is a person and a person of divine majesty and sovereignty who is here set before us from all the passages here quoted it is evident that many acts that only a person can perform are ascribed to the holy spirit three an office is predicated of the holy spirit that can only be predicated of a person our saviour says in john chapter fourteen verses six and seven and i will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you for ever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you our lord had announced to the disciples that he was about to leave them an awful sense of desolation took possession of them sorrow filled their hearts john chapter sixteen verse six at the contemplation of their loneliness and absolute helplessness when jesus should thus leave them alone to comfort them the lord tells them that they shall not be left alone that in leaving them he was going to the father and that he would pray the father and he would give them another comforter to take the place of himself during his absence is it possible that jesus christ could have used such language if the other comforter who was coming to take his place was only an impersonal influence or power still more is it possible that jesus should have said as he did in john chapter sixteen verse seven nevertheless i tell you the truth it is expedient for you that i go away for if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if i depart i will send him unto you if this comforter whom he was to send was simply an impersonal influence or power no one divine person was going another person just as divine was coming to take his place and it was expedient for the disciples that the one go to represent them before the father for another just as divine and sufficient was coming to take his place this promise of our lord and saviour of the coming of the other comforter and of his abiding with us is the greatest and best of all for the present dispensation this is the promise of the father acts chapter one verse four 
the promise of promises we shall take it up again when we come to study the names of the holy spirit four a treatment is predicated to the holy spirit that could only be predicated of a person we read in isaiah chapter sixty three verse ten revised version but they rebelled and grieved his holy spirit therefore he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them here we are told that the holy spirit is rebelled against and grieved confer ephesians chapter four verse thirty only a person can be rebelled against and only a person of authority only a person can be grieved you cannot grieve a mere influence or power in hebrews chapter ten verse twenty nine we read of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the son of god and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace here we are told that the holy spirit is done despite unto treated with contumely thayer's greek english lexicon of the new testament there is but one kind of entity in the universe that can be treated with contumely or insulted and that is a person it is absurd to think of treating an influence or a power of any kind of being except a person with contumely we read again in acts chapter five verse three but peter said ananias why hath satan filled thine heart to lie to the holy ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land here we have the holy spirit represented as one who can be lied to one cannot lie to anything but a person in matthew chapter twelve verses thirty one and thirty two we read wherefore i say unto you all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men but the blasphemy against the holy ghost shall not be forgiven unto men and whosoever speaketh a word against the son of man it shall be forgiven him but whosoever speaketh against the holy ghost it shall not be forgiven him neither in this world neither in the world to come here we are told that the holy spirit is blasphemed against it is impossible to blaspheme anything but a person if the holy spirit is not a person it certainly cannot be a more serious and decisive sin to blaspheme him than it is to blaspheme the son of man our lord and saviour jesus christ himself here then we have four distinctive and decisive lines of proof that the holy spirit is a person theoretically most of us believe this but do we in our real thought of him and in our practical attitude towards him treat him as if he were indeed a person at the close of an address on the personality of the holy spirit at a bible conference some years ago one who had been a church member many years a member of one of the most orthodox of our modern denominations said to me i never thought of it before as a person doubtless this christian woman had often sung praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly host praise father son and holy ghost doubtless she had often sung glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen but it is one thing to sing words it is quite another thing to realize the meaning of what we sing if this christian woman had been questioned in regard to her doctrine she would doubtless have said that she believed that there were three persons in the godhead father son and holy spirit but a theological confession is one thing a practical realization of the truth we confess is quite another so the question is altogether necessary no matter how orthodox you may be in your creedal statements do you regard the holy spirit as indeed as real a person as jesus christ as loving and wise and strong as worthy of your confidence and love and surrender as jesus christ himself the holy spirit came into this world to be to the disciples of our lord after his departure and to us what jesus christ had been to them during the days of his personal companionship with them john chapter nineteen verses sixteen and seventeen is he that to you do you know him every week in your life you hear the apostolic benediction the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the communion of the holy ghost be with you all second corinthians chapter thirteen verse fourteen but while you hear it do you take in the significance of it do you know the communion of the holy ghost the fellowship of the holy ghost the partnership of the holy ghost the comradeship of the holy ghost the intimate personal friendship of the holy ghost herein lies the whole secret of a real christian life 
a life of liberty and joy and power and fullness to have as one's ever-present friend and to be conscious that one has as his ever-present friend the holy spirit and to surrender one's life in all its departments entirely to his control this is true christian living the doctrine of the personality of the holy spirit is as distinctive of the religion that jesus taught as the doctrines of the deity and the atonement of jesus christ himself but it is not enough to believe the doctrine one must know the holy spirit himself the whole purpose of this chapter god help me say it reverently is to introduce you to my friend the holy spirit end of chapter one chapter two of the person and work of the holy spirit by r a torrey this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter 2. The Deity of the Holy Spirit In the preceding chapter we have seen clearly that the Holy Spirit is a person. But what sort of a person is he? Is he a finite person or an infinite person? Is he God? This question also is plainly answered in the Bible. There are in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments five distinct and decisive lines of proof of the deity of the holy spirit one each of the four distinctively divine attributes is ascribed to the holy spirit what are the distinctly divine attributes eternity omnipresence omniscience and omnipotence all of these are ascribed to the holy spirit in the bible we find eternity ascribed to the holy spirit in hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Omnipresence is ascribed to the Holy Spirit in Psalm 139, verses 7 to 10. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there if i take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me omniscience is ascribed to the holy spirit in several passages for example we read in first corinthians chapter two verses ten and eleven but god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Again, in John chapter 19, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Still further we read in John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, revised version i have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now howbeit when he the spirit of truth is come he shall guide you into all the truth for he shall not speak from himself but what things soever he shall hear these shall he speak and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come we find omnipotence ascribed to the holy spirit in luke chapter 1 verse 35 and the angel answered and said unto her the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. 2. Three distinctly divine works are ascribed to the Holy Spirit. When we think of God and His work, the first work of which we always think is that of creation. In the Scriptures creation is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. We read in Job chapter 33 verse 4, the Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. We read again in Psalm 104, verse 30, Thou sendest forth thy Spirit, they are created. Thou renewest the face of the earth. In connection with the description of creation in the first chapter of Genesis, the activity of the Spirit is referred to. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The impartation of life is also a divine work, and this is ascribed in the scriptures to the holy spirit we read in john chapter six verse six american revised version it is the spirit that giveth life the flesh profiteth nothing we read also in romans chapter eight verse eleven
but if the spirit of him that raised up jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you in the description of the creation of man in genesis chapter two verse seven it is the breath of god that is the holy spirit who imparts life to man and man becomes a living soul the exact words are and the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul the greek word which is rendered spirit means breath and though the holy spirit as a person does not come out distinctly in this early reference to him in genesis chapter two verse seven nevertheless this passage interpreted in the light of the fuller revelation of the new testament clearly refers to the holy spirit the authorship of divine prophecies is also ascribed to the holy spirit we read in second peter chapter one verse twenty one revised version for no prophecy ever came by the will of man but man spake from god being moved by the holy spirit even in the old testament there is a reference to the holy spirit as the author of prophecy we read in second samuel chapter twenty three verses two and three the spirit of the lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue the god of israel said the rock of israel spake to me he that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of god so we see that the three distinctly divine works of creation the impartation of life and prophecy are ascribed to the holy spirit three statements which in the old testament distinctly name the lord or jehovah as their subject are applied to the holy spirit in the new testament i e the holy spirit occupies the position of deity in new testament thought a striking illustration of this is found in isaiah chapter six verses eight to ten also i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us then said i here am i send me and he said go and tell this people hear ye indeed but understand not and see ye indeed but perceive not make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed in these five verses we are told that it was jehovah whenever the word lord is spelled in capitals in the old testament it stands for jehovah in the hebrew and is so rendered in the american revision whom isaiah saw and who speaks but in acts chapter twenty eight verses twenty five to twenty seven there is a reference to this statement of isaiah's and whereas in isaiah we are told it is jehovah who speaks in the reference in acts we are told that it was the holy spirit who was the speaker the passage in acts reads as follows and when they agreed not among themselves they departed after that paul had spoken one word well spake the holy ghost by isaiah the prophet unto our fathers saying go unto this people and say hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand and seeing ye shall see and not perceive for the heart of this people is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and i should heal them so we see that what is distinctly ascribed to jehovah in the old testament is ascribed to the holy spirit in the new i e the holy spirit is identified with jehovah it is a noteworthy fact that in the gospel of john the twelfth chapter and the thirty-ninth to forty-first verses where another reference is made to this passage in isaiah the same passage is ascribed to christ note carefully the forty-first verse so in different parts of scripture we have the same passage referred to jehovah referred to the holy spirit and referred to jesus christ may we not find the explanation of this in the threefold holy of the seraphic cry in isaiah chapter six verse three where we read and one cried unto another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory in this we have a distinct suggestion of the tri-personality of the jehovah of hosts and hence the propriety of the threefold application of the vision a further suggestion of this tri-personality of jehovah of hosts is found in the eighth verse of the chapter where the lord is represented as saying whom shall i send and who will go for us another striking illustration of the application of passages in the new testament to the holy spirit which in the old testament distinctly named jehovah as their subject 
is found in exodus chapter six verse seven here we read and in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the lord for that he heareth your murmurings against the lord and what are we that ye murmur against us here the murmuring of the children of israel is distinctly said to be against jehovah but in hebrews chapter three verses seven to nine where this instance is referred to we read wherefore as the holy ghost saith to-day if ye will hear his voice harden not your hearts and in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me proved me and saw my works for forty years the murmurings which moses in the book of exodus says were against jehovah we are told in the epistle to the hebrews were against the holy spirit this leaves it beyond question that the holy spirit occupies the position of jehovah or deity in the new testament confer also psalm ninety five verses eight to ten four the name of the holy spirit is coupled with that of god in a way it would be impossible for a reverent and thoughtful mind to couple the name of any finite being with that of the deity we have an illustration of this in first corinthians chapter twelve verses four and six now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit and there are differences of administrations but the same lord and there are diversities of operations but it is the same god which worketh all in all here we find god and the lord and the spirit associated together in a relation of equality that would be shocking to contemplate if the spirit were a finite being we have a still more striking illustration of this in matthew chapter twenty eight verse nineteen go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost who that had grasped the bible conception of god the father would think for a moment of coupling the name of the holy spirit with that of the father in this way if the holy spirit were a finite being even the most exalted of angelic beings another striking illustration is found in second corinthians chapter thirteen verse fourteen the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god and the communion of the holy ghost be with you all amen can any one ponder these words and catch anything like their real import without seeing clearly that it would be impossible to couple the name of the holy spirit with that of god the father in the way in which it is coupled in this verse unless the holy spirit were himself a divine being five the holy spirit is called god the final and decisive proof of the deity of the holy spirit is found in the fact that he is called god in the new testament we read in acts chapter five verses three and four but peter said ananias why hath satan filled thy heart to lie to the holy spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land whiles it remained was it not thy own and after it was sold was it not in thine own power why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart thou hast not lied unto men but unto god in the first part of this passage we are told that ananias lied to the holy spirit when this is further explained we are told that it was not unto men but unto god that he had lied in lying to the holy spirit i e the holy spirit to whom he lied is called god to sum it all up by the ascription of all the distinctly divine attributes and several distinctly divine works by referring statements which in the old testament clearly name jehovah the lord or god as their subject to the holy spirit in the new testament by coupling the name of the holy spirit with that of god in a way that would be impossible to couple that of any finite being with that of deity by plainly calling the holy spirit god in all these unmistakable ways god in his own word distinctly proclaims that the holy spirit is a divine person end of chapter two chapter three of the person and work of the holy spirit by r a tory this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter three the distinction of the holy spirit from the father and from his son jesus christ we have seen thus far that the holy spirit is a person and a divine person and now another question arises is he as a person separate and distinct from the father and from the son one who carefully studies the new testament statements cannot but discover that beyond a question he is we read in luke chapter two verses twenty one and twenty two now when all the people were baptized it came to pass that jesus also being baptized and praying 
the heaven was opened and the holy ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven which said thou art my beloved son in thee i am well pleased here the clearest possible distinction is drawn between jesus christ who was on earth and the father who spoke to him from heaven as one person speaks to another person and the holy spirit who descended in a bodily form as a dove from the father who is speaking to the son to whom he is speaking and rested upon the son as a person separate and distinct from himself we see a clear distinction drawn between the name of the father and that of the son and that of the holy spirit in matthew chapter twenty eight verse nineteen where we read go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost the distinction of the holy spirit from the father and the son comes out again with exceeding clearness in john chapter fourteen verse sixteen here we read and i will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you for ever here we see the one person the son praying to another person the father and the father to whom he prays giving another person another comforter in answer to the prayer of the second person the son if words mean anything and certainly in the bible they mean what they say there can be no mistaking it that the father and the son and the spirit are three distinct and separate persons again in john chapter sixteen verse seven a clear distinction is drawn between jesus who goes away to the father and the holy spirit who comes from the father to take his place jesus says nevertheless i tell you the truth it is expedient for you that i go away for if i do not go away the comforter will not come unto you but if i depart i will send him unto you a similar distinction is drawn in acts chapter two verse thirty three where we read therefore being by the right hand of god exalted and having received of the father the promise of the holy ghost he shed forth this which ye now see and hear in this passage the clearest possible distinction is drawn between the son exalted to the right hand of the father and the father to whose right hand he is exalted and the holy spirit whom the son receives from the father and sheds forth upon the church to sum it all up again and again the bible draws the clearest possible distinction between the three persons the holy spirit the father and the son they are three separate personalities having mutual relations to one another acting upon one another speaking of or to one another applying the pronouns of the second and third person to one another end of chapter three Chapter Four of *The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit* by R. A. Torrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Four: The Subordination of the Spirit to the Father and to the Son. From the fact that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, it does not follow that the Holy Spirit is in every sense equal to the Father. While the Scriptures teach that in Jesus Christ dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead in a bodily form. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and that he was so truly and fully divine that he could say I and the Father are one John chapter 10 verse 30 and he that hath seen me hath seen the Father John chapter 14 verse 9 they also teach with equal clearness that Jesus Christ was not equal to the Father in every respect but subordinate to the Father in many ways in a similar way the scriptures teach us that though the holy spirit is a divine person he is subordinate to the father and to the son in john chapter fourteen verse twenty six we are taught that the holy spirit is sent by the father and in the name of the son jesus declares very clearly but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you in john chapter fifteen verse twenty six we are told that it is jesus who sends the spirit from the father the exact words are but when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceedeth from the father he shall testify of me just as we are elsewhere taught that jesus christ was sent by the father john chapter six verse twenty nine and chapter eight verses twenty nine and forty two 
we are here taught that the Holy Spirit is in turn sent by Jesus Christ. The subordination of the Holy Spirit to the Father and the Son comes out also in the fact that He derives some of His names from the Father and from the Son. We read in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Here we have two names of the Spirit, one derived from his relation to the Father, the Spirit of God, and the other derived from his relation to the Son, the Spirit of Christ. In Acts chapter 16, verse 7, Revised Version, he is spoken of as the Spirit of Jesus. The subordination of the Spirit to the Son is also seen in the fact that the Holy Spirit speaks not from Himself, but speaks the words which He hears. We read in John chapter 16, verse 13, Revised Version, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He shall guide you into all the truth. For He shall not speak from Himself, but what things soever He shall hear, these he shall speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. In a similar way, Jesus said of himself, My teaching is not mine, but his that sent me. John chapter 7, verse 16, chapter 8, verses 26 and 40. The subordination of the Spirit to the Son comes out again in the clearly revealed fact that it is the work of the Holy Spirit not to glorify himself, but to glorify Christ. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 14, He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. In a similar way, Christ sought not his own glory, but the glory of him that sent him, that is, the Father. John chapter 7, verse 18. From all these passages, it is evident that the Holy Spirit in his present work, while possessed of all the attributes of deity, is subordinated to the Father and to the Son. On the other hand, we shall see later that in his earthly life, Jesus lived and taught and worked in the power of the Holy Spirit. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit by R. A. Torrey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 5 the person and work of the Holy Spirit, as revealed in His names. At least twenty-five different names are used in the Old and New Testaments in speaking of the Holy Spirit. There is the deepest significance in these names. By the careful study of them, we find a wonderful revelation of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Roman 1. The Spirit. The simplest name by which the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Bible is that which stands at the head of this paragraph, the Spirit. This name is also used as the basis of other names, so we begin our study with this. The Greek and Hebrew words so translated mean literally breath or wind. Both thoughts are in the name as applied to the Holy Spirit. 1. The thought of breath is brought out in John chapter 20, verse 22, where we read, and when he had said this, he breathed on them, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. It is also suggested in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This becomes more evident when we compare with this Psalm 104, verse 30, Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth and Job chapter 33 verse 4, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. What is the significance of this name from the standpoint of these passages? It is that the Spirit is the outbreathing of God, His inmost life going forth in a personal form to quicken. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the inmost life of God Himself to dwell in a personal way in us. When we really grasp this thought, it is overwhelming in its solemnity. Just stop and think what it means to have the inmost life of that infinite and eternal being whom we call God, dwelling in a personal way in you. How solemn and how awful and yet unspeakably glorious life becomes when we realize this. 2. The thought of the Holy Spirit as the wind is brought out in John chapter 3, verses 6-8. to 8. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit marvel not that i say unto thee ye must be born again the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth so is every one that is born of the spirit in the greek it is the same word that is translated in one part of this passage spirit and the other part of the passage wind and it would seem as if the word ought to be translated the same way in both parts of the passage it would then read that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of the wind is wind marvel not that i say unto thee ye must be born again the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth so is every one that is born of the wind the full significance of this name as applied to the holy spirit or holy wind it may be beyond us to fathom but we can see at least this much of its meaning part one the spirit like the wind is sovereign the wind bloweth where it listeth john chapter three verse eight you cannot dictate to the wind it does as it wills just so with the holy spirit he is sovereign we cannot dictate to him he divides to each man severally even as he will first corinthians chapter twelve verse eleven revised version when the wind is blowing from the north you may long to have it blow from the south but cry as clamorously as you may to the wind blow from the south it will keep right on blowing from the north but while you cannot dictate to the wind while it blows as it will you may learn the laws that govern the wind's motions and by bringing yourself into harmony with those laws you can get the wind to do your work you can erect your windmill so that whatever way the wind blows from the wheels will turn and the wind will grind your grain or pump your water just so while we cannot dictate to the holy spirit we can learn the laws of his operations and by bringing ourselves into harmony with those laws above all by submitting our wills absolutely to his sovereign will the spirit of god will work through us and accomplish his own glorious work by our instrumentality part two the spirit like the wind is invisible but none the less perceptible and real and mighty you hear the sound of the wind john chapter three verse eight but the wind itself you never see you hear the voice of the spirit but he himself is ever invisible the word translated sound in john chapter three verse eight is the word which elsewhere is translated voice see revised version we not only hear the voice of the wind but we see its mighty effects we feel the breath of the wind upon our cheeks we see the dust and the leaves blowing before the wind we see the vessels at sea driven swiftly toward their ports but the wind itself remains invisible just so with the spirit we feel his breath upon our souls we see the mighty things he does but he himself we do not see he is invisible but he is real and perceptible i shall never forget a solemn hour in chicago avenue church chicago dr w w white was making a farewell address before going to india to work among the students there suddenly without any apparent warning the place was filled with an awful and glorious presence to me it was very real but the question arose in my mind is this merely subjective just a feeling of my own or is there an objective presence here after the meeting was over i asked different persons whether they were conscious of anything and found that at the same point in the meeting they too though they saw no one became distinctly conscious of an overwhelming presence the presence of the holy spirit though many years have passed there are those who speak of that hour to this day on another occasion in my own home at chicago while kneeling in prayer with an intimate friend as we prayed it seemed as if an unseen and awful presence entered the room i realized what eliphaz had meant when he said then a spirit passed before my face the hair of my flesh stood up job chapter four verse fifteen the moment was overwhelming but as glorious as it was awful these are but two illustrations of which many might be given none of us have seen the holy spirit at any time but of his presence we have been distinctly conscious again and again and again his mighty power we have witnessed and his reality we cannot doubt there are those who tell us that they do not believe in anything which they cannot see not one of them has ever seen the wind but they all believe in the wind they have felt the wind and they have seen its effects 
and just so we beyond a question have felt the mighty presence of the spirit and witnessed his mighty workings part three the spirit like the wind is inscrutable thou canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth nothing in nature is more mysterious than the wind but more mysterious still is the holy spirit in his operations we hear of how suddenly and unexpectedly in widely separated communities he begins to work his mighty work doubtless there are hidden reasons why he does thus begin his work but oftentimes these reasons are completely undiscoverable by us we know not whence he comes nor whither he goes we cannot tell where next he will display his mighty and gracious power part four the spirit like the wind is indispensable without wind that is air in motion there is no life and so jesus says verily verily i say unto you except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god if the wind should absolutely cease to blow for a single hour most of the life of this earth would cease to be time and again when the health reports of the different cities of the united states are issued it has been found that the five healthiest cities in the united states were five cities located on the great lakes many have been surprised at this report when they have visited some of these cities and found that they were far from being the cleanest cities or most sanitary in their general arrangement and yet year after year this report has been returned the explanation is simply this it is the wind blowing from the lakes that has brought life and health to the cities just so when the spirit ceases to blow in any heart or any church or any community death ensues but when the spirit blows steadily upon the individual or the church or the community there is abounding spiritual life and health part five closely related to the foregoing thought like the wind the holy spirit is life-giving this thought comes out again and again in the scriptures for example we read in john chapter six verse sixty three american revised version it is the spirit that giveth life and in second corinthians chapter three verse six we read the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life perhaps the most suggestive passage on this point is ezekiel chapter thirty seven verses eight nine and ten and when i beheld lo the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them above but there was no breath in them then said he unto me prophesy unto the wind prophesy son of man and say to the wind thus saith the lord god come from the four winds o breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live so i prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army compare john chapter three verse five israel in the prophet's vision was only bones very many and very dry verses two and eleven until the prophet proclaimed unto them the word of god then there was a noise and a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone and the sinews and the flesh came upon the bones but still there was no life but when the wind blew the breath of god's spirit then they stood up upon their feet in an exceeding great army all life in the individual believer in the teacher the preacher and the church is the holy spirit's work you will sometimes make the acquaintance of a man and as you hear him talk and observe his conduct you are repelled and disgusted everything about him declares that he is a dead man a moral corpse and not only dead but rapidly putrefying you get away from him as quickly as you can months afterwards you meet him again you hesitate to speak to him you want to get out of his very presence but you do speak to him and he has not uttered many sentences before you notice a marvellous change his conversation is sweet and wholesome and uplifting everything about his manner is attractive and delightful you soon discover that the man's whole conduct and life has been transformed he is no longer a putrefying corpse but a living child of god what has happened the wind of god has blown upon him he has received the holy spirit the holy wind some quiet sabbath day you visit a church everything about the outward appointments of the church are all that could be desired there is an attractive meeting-house an expensive organ a gifted choir a scholarly preacher the service is well arranged 
but you have not been long at the gathering before you are forced to see that there is no life that it is all form and that there is nothing really being accomplished for god or for man you go away with a heavy heart months afterwards you have occasion to visit the church again the outward appointments of the church are much as they were before but the service has not proceeded far before you note a great difference there is a new power in the singing a new spirit in the prayer a new grip in the preaching everything about the church is teeming with the life of god what has happened the wind of god has blown upon that church the holy spirit the holy wind has come you go some day to hear a preacher of whose abilities you have heard great reports as he stands up to preach you learn that nothing too much has been said in praise of his abilities from the merely intellectual and rhetorical standpoint his diction is faultless his style beautiful his logic unimpeachable his orthodoxy beyond criticism it is an intellectual treat to listen to him and yet after all as he preaches you cannot avoid a feeling of sadness for there is no real grip no real power indeed no reality of any kind in the man's preaching you go away with a heavy heart at the thought of this waste of magnificent abilities months perhaps years pass by and you again find yourself listening to this celebrated preacher but what a change the same faultless diction the same beautiful style the same unimpeachable logic the same skilful elocution the same sound orthodoxy but now there is something more there is reality life grip power in the preaching men and women sit breathless as he speaks sinners bowed with tears of contrition pricked to their hearts with conviction of sin men and women and boys and girls renounce their selfishness and their sin and their worldliness and accept jesus christ and surrender their lives to him what has happened the wind of god has blown upon that man he has been filled with the holy wind part six like the wind the holy spirit is irresistible we read in acts chapter one verse eight but ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon ye and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth when this promise of our lord was fulfilled in stephen we read and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake a man filled with the holy spirit is transformed into a cyclone what can stand before the wind when st cloud minnesota was visited with a cyclone years ago the wind picked up loaded freight cars and carried them away off the track it wrenched an iron bridge from its foundations twisted it together and hurled it away when a cyclone later visited st louis missouri it cut off telegraph poles a foot in diameter as if they had been pipe stems it cut off enormous trees close to the root it cut off the corner of brick buildings where it passed as though they had been cut by a knife nothing could stand before it and so nothing can stand before a spirit-filled preacher of the word none can resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he speaks the wind of god took possession of charles g finney an obscure country lawyer and sent him through new york state then through new england then through england mowing down strong men by his resistless spirit-given logic one night in rochester scores of lawyers led by the justice of the court of appeals filed out of the pews and bowed in the aisles and yielded their lives to god the wind of god took possession of d l moody an uneducated young businessman in chicago and in the power of this resistless wind men and women and young people were mowed down before his words and brought in humble confession and renunciation of sin to the feet of jesus christ and filled with the life of god they have been the pillars in the churches of great britain and throughout the world ever since the great need to-day in individuals in churches and in preachers is that the wind of god blow upon us much of the difficulty that many find with john chapter three verse five jesus answered verily verily i say unto thee except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of god would disappear if we would only bear in mind that spirit means wind and translate the verse literally all through except a man be born of water and wind there is no thee in the original he cannot enter the kingdom of god the thought would then seem to be except a man be born of the cleansing and quickening power of the spirit or else of a cleansing word compare john chapter fifteen verse three 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, James chapter 1, verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, and the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. Roman 2. The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is frequently spoken of in the Bible as the Spirit of God. For example, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? In this name we have the same essential thought as in the former name, but with this addition, that his divine origin, nature, and power are emphasized. He is not merely the wind, as seen above, but the wind of God. Roman 3. The Spirit of Jehovah. This name is used of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, American Revised Version. And the Spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him. The thought of the name is, of course, essentially the same as the preceding, with the exception that God is here thought of as the covenant God of Israel. He is thus spoken of in the connection in which the name is found. And, of course, the Bible, following that unerring accuracy that it always exhibits in its use of the different names for God, in this connection speaks of the Spirit as the Spirit of Jehovah, and not merely as the Spirit of God. Roman 4. The Spirit of the Lord Jehovah. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of the Lord Jehovah in Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1 to 3, American Revised Version. The Spirit of the Lord Jehovah is upon me, because Jehovah hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, etc. The Holy Spirit is here spoken of not merely as the Spirit of Jehovah, but the Spirit of the Lord Jehovah, because of the relation in which God himself is spoken of in this connection, as not merely Jehovah, the covenant God of Israel, but as Jehovah Israel's Lord, as well as their covenant-keeping God. This name of the Spirit is even more expressive than the name, the Spirit of God. Roman 5. The Spirit of the Living God. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of the Living God in Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. What is the significance of this name? It is made clear by the context. The Apostle Paul is drawing a contrast between the word of God written with ink on parchment and the word of God written on tables that are hearts of flesh. Revised Version by the Holy Spirit, who in this connection is called the Spirit of the living God, because he makes God a living reality in our personal experience instead of a mere intellectual concept. There are many who believe in God, and who are perfectly orthodox in their conception of God, but after all God is to them only an intellectual theological proposition. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to make God something vastly more than a theological notion, no matter how orthodox. He is the Spirit of the living God, and it is His work to make God a living God to us, a being whom we know, with whom we have personal acquaintance, a being more real to us than the most intimate human friend we have. Have you a real God? Well, you may have. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the living God, and He is able and ready to give you a living God, to make God real in your personal experience. There are many who have a God who once lived and acted and spoke, a God who lived and acted at the creation of the universe, who perhaps lived and acted in the days of Moses and Elijah and Jesus Christ and the apostles, but who no longer lives and acts. If he exists at all, he has withdrawn himself from any active part in nature or the history of man. He created nature and gave it its laws and powers and now leaves it to run itself, he created man and endowed him with his various faculties, but has now left him to work out his own destiny. They may go further than this. They may believe in a God who spoke to Abraham and to Moses and to David and to Isaiah and to Jesus and to the apostles, but who speaks no longer. We may read in the Bible what he spoke to these various men, but we cannot expect him to speak to us. In contrast with these, it is the work of the Holy Spirit the Spirit of the living God, to give us to know a God who lives and acts and speaks today, a God who is ready to come as near to us as he came to Abraham, to Moses, or to Isaiah, or to the apostles, or to Jesus himself. 
not that he has any new revelations to make for he guided the apostles into all the truth john chapter sixteen verse three revised version but though there has been a complete revelation of god's truth made in the bible still god lives to-day and will speak to us directly as he spoke to his chosen ones of old happy is the man who knows the holy spirit as the spirit of the living god and who consequently has a real god a god who lives to-day a god upon whom he can depend to-day to undertake for him a god with whom he enjoys intimate personal friendship a god to whom he may raise his voice in prayer and who speaks back to him roman six the spirit of christ in romans chapter eight verse nine but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god dwell in you now if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of his the holy spirit is called the spirit of christ the spirit of christ in this passage does not mean a christ-like spirit it means something far more than that it means that which lies back of a christ-like spirit it is a name of the holy spirit why is the holy spirit called the spirit of christ for several reasons one because he is christ's gift the holy spirit is not merely the gift of the father but the gift of the son as well we read in john chapter twenty verse twenty two that jesus breathed on them and said unto them receive ye the holy ghost the holy spirit is therefore the breath of christ as well as the breath of god the father it is christ who breathes upon and imparts to us the holy spirit in john chapter fourteen verse fifteen and the following verses jesus teaches us that it is in answer to his prayer that the father gives to us the holy spirit in acts chapter two verse thirty three we read that jesus being by the right hand of god exalted and having received of the father the promise of the holy spirit shed him forth upon believers that is that jesus having been exalted to the right hand of god in answer to his prayer receives the holy spirit from the father and sheds forth upon the church him whom he hath received from the father in matthew chapter three verse eleven we read that it is jesus who baptizes with the holy spirit in john chapter seven verses thirty seven to thirty nine jesus bids all that are thirsty to come unto him and drink and the context makes it clear that the water he gives is the holy spirit who becomes in those who receive him a source of life and power flowing out to others it is the glorified christ who gives to the church the holy spirit in the fourth chapter of john and the tenth verse jesus declares that he is the one who gives the living water the holy spirit in all these passages christ is set forth as one who gives the holy spirit so the holy spirit is called the spirit of christ two but there is a deeper reason why the holy spirit is called the spirit of christ i e because it is the work of the holy spirit to reveal christ to us in john chapter sixteen verse fourteen revised version we read he that is the holy spirit shall glorify me for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you in a similar way in john chapter fifteen verse twenty six revised version it is written but when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceedeth from the father he shall bear witness of me this is the work of the holy spirit to bear witness of christ and reveal jesus christ to men and as the revealer of christ he is called the spirit of christ three but there is a still deeper reason yet why the holy spirit is called the spirit of christ and that is because it is his work to form christ as a living presence within us in ephesians chapter three verses sixteen and seventeen the apostle paul prays to the father that he would grant to believers according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his holy spirit in the inner man that christ may dwell in their hearts by faith this then is the work of the holy spirit to cause christ to dwell in our hearts to form the living christ within us just as the holy spirit literally and physically formed jesus christ in the womb of the virgin mary luke chapter one verse thirty five so the holy spirit spiritually but really forms jesus christ within our hearts to-day in john chapter fourteen verses sixteen to eighteen jesus told his disciples that when the holy spirit came that he himself would come that is the result of the coming of the holy spirit to dwell in their hearts would be the coming of christ himself it is the privilege of every believer in christ to have the living christ formed by the power of the holy spirit in his own heart 
and therefore the holy spirit who thus forms christ within the heart is called the spirit of christ how wonderful how glorious is the significance of this name let us ponder it until we understand it as far as it is possible to understand it and until we rejoice exceedingly in the glory of it romans seven the spirit of jesus christ the holy spirit is called the spirit of jesus christ in philippians chapter one verse nineteen for i know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of jesus christ the spirit is not merely the spirit of the eternal word but the spirit of the word incarnate not merely the spirit of christ but the spirit of jesus christ it is the man jesus exalted to the right hand of the father who receives and sends the spirit so we read in acts chapter two verses thirty two and thirty three this jesus hath god raised up whereof we all are witnesses therefore being by the right hand of god exalted and having received of the father the promise of the holy ghost he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear roman eight the spirit of jesus the holy spirit is called the spirit of jesus in acts chapter sixteen verses six and seven revised version and they went through the region of Phygia and Galatia, having been forbidden of the Holy Ghost to speak the word in Asia. And when they were come over against Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus suffered them not. By the using of this name, the Spirit of Jesus, the thought of the relation of the Spirit to the man Jesus is still more clear than in the name preceding this, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Roman 9 the spirit of his son the holy spirit is called the spirit of his son in galatians chapter four verse six and because ye are sons god hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying abba father we see from the context verses four and five that this name is given to the holy spirit in special connection with his testifying to the sonship of the believer it is the spirit of his son who testifies to our sonship the thought is that the holy spirit is a filial spirit a spirit who produces a sense of sonship in us if we receive the holy spirit we no longer think of god as if we were serving under constraint and bondage but we are sons living in joyous liberty we do not fear god we trust him and rejoice in him when we receive the holy spirit we do not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear but a spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father romans chapter eight verse fifteen this name of the holy spirit is one of the most suggestive of all we do well to ponder it long until we realize the glad fullness of its significance we shall take it up again when we come to study the work of the holy spirit roman ten the holy spirit this name is of very frequent occurrence and the name with which most of us are most familiar one of the most familiar passages in which the name is used is luke chapter eleven verse thirteen if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the holy spirit to them that ask him this name emphasizes the essential moral character of the spirit he is holy in himself we are so familiar with the name that we neglect to weigh its significance oh if we only realized more deeply and constantly that he is the holy spirit we would do well if we as the seraphim in isaiah's vision would bow in his presence and cry holy 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 yet how thoughtlessly oftentimes we talk about him and pray for him we pray for him to come into our churches and into our hearts but what would he find if he should come there would he not find much that would be painful and agonizing to him what would we think if vile women from the lowest den of iniquity in a great city should go to the purest woman of that city and invite her to come and live with them in their disgusting vileness with no intention of changing their evil ways but that would not be as shocking as for you and me to ask the holy spirit to come and dwell in our hearts when we have no thought of giving up our impurity or our selfishness or our worldliness or our sin it would not be as shocking as it is for us to invite the holy spirit to come into our churches when they are full of worldliness and selfishness and contention and envy and pride and all that is unholy but if the denizens of the lowest and vilest den of infamy should go to the purest and most christ-like woman 
asking her to go and dwell with them with the intention of putting away everything that was vile and evil and giving to this holy and christ-like woman the entire control of the place she would go and as sinful and selfish and imperfect as we may be the infinitely holy spirit is ready to come and take his dwelling in our heart if we will surrender to him the absolute control of our lives and allow him to bring everything in thought and fancy and feeling and purpose and imagination and action into conformity with his will the infinitely holy spirit is ready to come into our churches however imperfect and worldly they may be now if we are willing to put the absolute control of everything in his hands but let us never forget that he is the holy spirit and when we pray for him let us pray for him as such roman eleven the holy spirit of promise the holy spirit is called the holy spirit of promise in ephesians chapter one verse thirteen revised version in whom ye also having heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom having also believed ye were sealed with the holy spirit of promise we have here the same name as that given above with the added thought that this holy spirit is the great promise of the father and of the son the holy spirit is god's great all-inclusive promise for the present dispensation the only thing for which jesus bade the disciples wait after his ascension before they undertook his work was the promise of the father that is the holy spirit acts chapter one verses four and five the great promise of the father until the coming of christ was the coming atoning saviour and king but when jesus came and died his atoning death upon the cross of calvary and arose and ascended to the right hand of the father then the second great promise of the father was the holy spirit to take the place of our absent lord see also acts chapter two verse thirty three roman twelve the spirit of holiness the holy spirit is called the spirit of holiness in romans chapter one verse four and declared to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead at the first glance it may seem as if there were no essential difference between the two names the holy spirit and the spirit of holiness but there is a marked difference the name of the holy spirit as already said emphasizes the essential moral character of the spirit as holy but the name of the spirit of holiness brings out the thought that the holy spirit is not merely holy in himself but he imparts holiness to others the perfect holiness which he himself possesses he imparts to those who receive him compare first peter chapter one verse two roman thirteen the spirit of judgment the holy spirit is called the spirit of judgment in isaiah chapter four verse four when the lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of zion and shall have purged the blood of jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning there are two names of the holy spirit in this passage first the spirit of judgment the holy spirit is so called because it is his work to bring sin to light to convict of sin compare john chapter sixteen verses seven to nine when the holy spirit comes to us the first thing that he does is to open our eyes to see our sins as god sees them he judges our sin we will go into this more at length in studying john chapter sixteen verses seven to eleven when considering the work of the holy spirit roman fourteen the spirit of burning this name is used in the passage just quoted above this name emphasizes his searching refining dross-consuming illuminating and energizing work the holy spirit is like a fire in the heart in which he dwells and as fire tests and refines and consumes and illuminates and warms and energizes so does he in the context it is the cleansing work of the holy spirit which is especially emphasized isaiah chapter four verses three and four fifteen the spirit of truth the holy spirit is called the spirit of truth in john chapter fourteen verse seven even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not neither knoweth him but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you compare john chapter fifteen verse twenty six chapter sixteen verse thirteen the holy spirit is called the spirit of truth because it is the work of the holy spirit to communicate truth to impart truth to those who receive him this comes out in the passage given above and if possible it comes out even more clearly in john chapter sixteen verse thirteen revised version 
howbeit when he the spirit of truth is come he shall guide you into all the truth for he shall not speak from himself but what things soever he shall hear these shall he speak and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come all truth is from the holy spirit it is only as he teaches us that we come to know the truth Romans 16 the spirit of wisdom and understanding the holy spirit is called the spirit of wisdom and understanding in isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 and the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the lord the significance of the name is so plain as to need no explanation it is evident both from the words used and from the context that it is the work of the holy spirit to impart wisdom and understanding to those who receive him those who receive the holy spirit receive the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind or sound sense second timothy chapter one verse seven roman seventeen the spirit of counsel and might we find this name used of the holy spirit in the passage given under the preceding head the meaning of this name too is obvious the holy spirit is called the spirit of counsel and of might because he gives us counsel in all our plans and strength to carry them out compare acts chapter eight verse twenty nine chapter sixteen verses six and seven chapter one verse eight it is our privilege to have god's own counsel in all our plans and god's strength in all the work that we undertake for him we receive them by receiving the holy spirit the spirit of counsel and might roman eighteen the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the lord this name is also used in the passage given above isaiah chapter eleven verse two the significance of this name is also obvious it is the work of the holy spirit to impart knowledge to us and to beget in us a reverence for jehovah that reverence that reveals itself above all in obedience to his commandments the one who receives the holy spirit finds his delight in the fear of the lord see isaiah chapter eleven verse three revised version the three suggestive names just given refer especially to the gracious work of the holy spirit in the servant of the lord that is in christ jesus isaiah chapter eleven verses one to five roman nineteen the spirit of life the holy spirit is called the spirit of life in romans chapter eight verse two for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death the holy spirit is called the spirit of life because it is his work to impart life compare john chapter six verse sixty three revised version ezekiel chapter thirty seven verses one to ten in the context in which the name is found in the passage given above beginning back in the seventh chapter of romans seventh verse paul is drawing a contrast between the law of moses outside a man holy and just and good it is true but impotent and the living spirit of god in the heart imparting spiritual and moral life to the believer and enabling him thus to meet the requirements of the law of god so that what the law alone could not do in that it was weak through the flesh the spirit of god imparting life to the believer and dwelling in the heart enables him to do so that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in those who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit see romans chapter eight verses two to four the holy spirit is therefore called the spirit of life because he imparts spiritual life and consequent victory over sin to those who receive him roman twenty the oil of gladness the holy spirit is called the oil of gladness in hebrews chapter one verse nine thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity therefore god even thy god hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows some one may ask what reason have we for supposing that the oil of gladness in this passage is a name of the holy spirit the answer is found in a comparison of hebrews chapter one verse nine with acts chapter ten verse thirty eight and luke chapter four verse eighteen in acts chapter ten verse thirty eight we read how god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy ghost and with power and in luke chapter four verse eighteen jesus himself is recorded as saying the spirit of the lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor etc in both of these passages we are told that it was the holy spirit with which jesus was anointed and as in the passage in hebrews we are told that it was with the oil of gladness that he was anointed 
so of course the only possible conclusion is that the oil of gladness means the holy spirit what a beautiful and suggestive name it is for him whose fruit is first love then joy galatians chapter five verse twenty two the holy spirit becomes a source of boundless joy to those who receive him he so fills and satisfies the soul that the soul who receives him does not thirst for ever john chapter four verse fourteen no matter how great the afflictions with which the believer receives the word still he will have the joy of the holy ghost first thessalonians chapter one verse six on the day of pentecost when the disciples were baptized with the holy spirit they were so filled with ecstatic joy that others looking on them thought they were intoxicated they said these men are full of new wine and paul draws a comparison between abnormal intoxication that comes through the excess of wine and the wholesome exhilaration from which there is no reaction that comes through being filled with the spirit ephesians chapter five verses eighteen and twenty when god anoints one with the holy spirit it is as if he broke a precious alabaster box of oil of gladness above their heads until it ran down to the hem of their garments and the whole person was suffused with joy unspeakable and full of glory roman twenty one the spirit of grace the holy spirit is called the spirit of grace in hebrews chapter ten verse twenty nine of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the son of god and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace this name brings out the fact that it is the holy spirit's work to administer and apply the grace of god he himself is gracious it is true but the name means far more than that it means that he makes ours experimentally the manifold grace of god it is only by the work of the spirit of grace in our hearts that we are enabled to appropriate to ourselves that infinite fullness of grace that god has from the beginning bestowed upon us in jesus christ it is ours from the beginning as far as belonging to us is concerned but it is only ours experimentally as we claim it by the power of the spirit of grace roman twenty two the spirit of grace and of supplication the holy spirit is called the spirit of grace and of supplication in zechariah chapter twelve verse ten revised version and i will pour upon the house of david and upon the inhabitants of jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication and they shall look unto me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for his firstborn the phrase the spirit of grace and of supplication in this passage is beyond a doubt the name of the holy spirit the name the spirit of grace we have already had under the preceding head but here there is a further thought of that operation of grace that leads us to pray intensely the holy spirit is so called because it is he that teaches to pray because all true prayer is in the spirit jude twenty we of ourselves know not how to pray as we ought but it is the work of the holy spirit of intercession to make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered and to lead us out in prayer according to the will of god romans chapter eight verses twenty six and twenty seven the secret of all true and effective praying is knowing the holy spirit as the spirit of grace and supplication roman twenty three the spirit of glory the holy spirit is called the spirit of glory in first peter chapter four verse fourteen if ye be reproached for the name of christ happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of god resteth upon you on their part he is evil spoken of but on your part he is glorified this name does not merely teach that the holy spirit is infinitely glorious himself but it rather teaches that he imparts the glory of god to us just as the spirit of truth imparts truth to us and as the spirit of life imparts life to us and as the spirit of wisdom and understanding and of counsel and might and knowledge and of the fear of the lord imparts to us wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and fear of the lord and as the spirit of grace applies and administers to us the manifold grace of god so the spirit of glory is the administrator to us of god's glory in the immediately preceding verse we read but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy it is in this connection that he is called the spirit of glory 
we find a similar connection between the sufferings which we endure and the glory which the holy spirit imparts to us in romans chapter eight verses sixteen and seventeen the spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of god and if children then heirs heirs of god and joint heirs with christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified with him the holy spirit is the administrator of glory as well as of grace or rather of the grace that culminates in glory roman twenty four the eternal spirit the holy spirit is called the eternal spirit in hebrews chapter nine verse fourteen how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god the eternity and the deity and infinite majesty of the holy spirit are brought out by this name roman twenty five the holy spirit is called the comforter over and over again in the scriptures for example in john chapter fourteen verse twenty six we read but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you and in john chapter fifteen verse twenty six but when the comforter is come whom i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of truth which proceedeth from the father he shall testify of me see also john chapter sixteen verse twenty seven the word translated comforter in these passages means that but it means much more beside it is a word difficult of adequate translation into any one word in english the translators of the revised version found difficulty in deciding with what word to render the greek word so translated they have suggested in the margin of the revised version advocate helper and a simple transference of the greek word into english paraclete the word translated comforter means literally one called to another side the idea being one right at hand to take another's part it is the same word that is translated advocate in first john chapter two verse one my little children these things i write unto you that ye sin not and if any man sin we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous but advocate as we now understand it does not give the full force of the greek word so rendered etymologically advocate means nearly the same thing advocate is latin advocatus and it means one called to another to take his part but in our modern usage the word has acquired a restricted meaning the greek word translated comforter parakletos means one called alongside that is one called to stand constantly by one's side and who is ever ready to stand by us and take our part in everything in which his help is needed it is a wonderfully tender and expressive name for the holy one sometimes when we think of the holy spirit he seems to be so far away but when we think of the parakletos or in plain english our stand buyer or our part taker how near he is up to the time that jesus made this promise to the disciples he himself had been their parakletos when they were in any emergency or difficulty they turned to him on one occasion for example the disciples were in doubt as to how to pray and they turned to jesus and said lord teach us to pray and the lord taught them the wonderful prayer that has come down through the ages luke chapter eleven verses one to four on another occasion peter was sinking in the waves of galilee and he cried lord save me and immediately jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and saved him matthew chapter fourteen verses thirty and thirty one in every extremity they turned to him just so now that jesus is gone to the father we have another person just as divine as he is just as wise as he just as strong as he just as loving as he just as tender as he just as ready and just as able to help who is always right by our side yes better yet who dwells in our heart who will take hold and help if we only trust him to do it if the truth of the holy spirit as set forth in the name Paracletos once gets into our heart and abides there it will banish all loneliness for ever for how can we ever be lonely when this best of all friends is ever with us in the last eight years i have been called upon to endure what would naturally be a very lonely life most of the time i am separated from wife and children by the calls of duty for eighteen months consecutively i was separated from almost all my family by many thousands of miles 
the loneliness would have been unendurable were it not for the one all-sufficient friend who was always with me i recall one night walking up and down the deck of a storm-tossed steamer in the south seas most of my family were eighteen thousand miles away the remaining member of my family was not with me the officers were busy on the bridge and i was pacing the deck alone and the thought came to me here you are all alone and then another thought came to me i am not alone by my side as i walk this deck in the loneliness and the storm walks the holy spirit and he was enough i said something like this once at a bible conference in st paul a doctor came to me at the close of the meeting and gently said i want to thank you for that thought about the holy spirit always being with us i am a doctor oftentimes i have to drive far out in the country in the night and storm to attend a case and i have often been so lonely but i will never be lonely again i will always know that by my side in my doctor's carriage the holy spirit goes with me if this thought of the holy spirit as the ever-present paraclete once gets into your hearts and abides there it will banish all fear for ever how can we be afraid in the face of any peril if this divine one is by our side to counsel us and take our part there may be a howling mob about us or a lowering storm it matters not he stands between us and both mob and storm one night i had promised to walk four miles to a friend's house after an evening session of a conference the path led along the side of a lake as i started for my friend's house a thunderstorm was coming up i had not counted on this but as i had promised i felt i ought to go the path led along the edge of the lake oftentimes very near to the edge sometimes the lake was near the path and sometimes many feet below the night was so dark with the clouds one could not see ahead now and then there would be a blinding flash of lightning in which you could see where the path was washed away and then it would be blacker than ever you could hear the lake booming below it seemed a dangerous place to walk but that very week i had been speaking on the personality of the holy spirit and about the holy spirit as an ever-present friend and the thought came to me what was it you were telling the people in the address about the holy spirit as an ever-present friend and then i said to myself between me and the boiling lake and the edge of the path walks the holy spirit and i pushed on fearless and glad when we were in london a young lady attended the meeting one afternoon in the royal albert hall she had an abnormal fear of the dark it was absolutely impossible for her to go into a dark room alone but the thought of the holy spirit as an ever-present friend sank into her mind she went home and told her mother what a wonderful thought she had heard that day and how it had banished for ever all fear from her it was already growing very dark in the london winter afternoon and her mother looked up and said very well let us see if it is real go up to the top of the house and shut yourself alone in a dark room she instantly sprang to her feet bounded up the stairs went into a room that was totally dark and shut the door and sat down all fear was gone and as she wrote the next day the whole room seemed to be filled with a wonderful glory the glory of the presence of the holy spirit in the thought of the holy spirit as the paraclete there is also a cure for insomnia for two awful years i suffered from insomnia night after night i would go to bed apparently almost dead for sleep it seemed as though i must sleep but i could not sleep oh the agony of those two years it seemed as if i would lose my mind if i did not get relief relief came at last and for years i went on without the suggestion of trouble from insomnia then one night i retired to my room in the institute lay down expecting to fall asleep in a moment as i usually did but scarcely had my head touched the pillow when i became aware that insomnia was back again if one has ever had it he never forgets it and never mistakes it it seems as if insomnia were sitting on the footboard of my bed grinning at me and saying i am back again for another two years oh i thought two more awful years of insomnia but that very morning i had been lecturing to our students in the institute about the personality of the holy spirit and about the holy spirit as an ever-present friend and at once the thought came to me what were you talking to the students about this morning what were you telling them and i looked up and said thou blessed spirit of god thou art here i am not alone if thou hast anything to say to me i will listen and he began to open to me some of the deep and precious things about my lord and saviour things that filled my soul with joy and rest and the next thing i knew i was asleep and the next thing i knew it was to-morrow morning 
so whenever insomnia has come my way since i have simply remembered that the holy spirit was there and i have looked up to him to speak to me and to teach me and he has done so and insomnia has taken its flight in the thought of the holy spirit as the paraclete there is a cure for a breaking heart how many aching breaking hearts there are in this world of ours so full of death and separation from those we most dearly love how many a woman there is who a few years ago or a few months or a few weeks ago had no care no worry for by her side was a christian husband who was so wise and strong that the wife rested all responsibility upon him and she walked carefree through life and satisfied with his love and companionship but one awful day he was taken from her she was left alone and all the cares and responsibilities rested upon her how empty that heart has been ever since how empty the whole world has been she has just dragged through her life and her duties as best she could with an aching and almost breaking heart but there is one if she only knew it wiser and more loving than the tenderest husband one willing to bear all the care and responsibilities of life for her one who is able if she will only let him to fill every nook and corner of her empty and aching heart that one is the paraclete i said something like this in st andrew's hall in glasgow at the close of the meeting a sad-faced christian woman wearing a widow's garb came to me as i stepped out of the hall into the reception room she hurried to me and said dr torrey this is the anniversary of my dear husband's death just one year ago to-day he was taken from me i came to-day to see if you could not speak some word of help to me you have just given me the word i need i will never be lonesome again a year and a half passed by i was on the yacht of a friend in the locks of the clyde one day a little boat put out from shore and came alongside the yacht one of the first to come up the side of the yacht was this widow she hurried to me and the first thing she said was the thought that you gave me that day in st andrew's hall on the anniversary of my husband's leaving me has been with me ever since and the holy spirit does satisfy me and fill my heart but it is in our work for our master that the thought of the holy spirit as the paraclete comes with greatest helpfulness i think it may be permissible to illustrate it from my own experience i entered the ministry because i was literally forced to for years i refused to be a christian because i was determined that i would not be a preacher and i feared that if i surrendered to christ i must enter the ministry my conversion turned upon my yielding to him at this point the night i yielded i did not say i will accept christ or i will give up sin or anything of that sort i simply cried take this awful burden off my heart and i will preach the gospel but no one could be less fitted by natural temperament for the ministry than i from early boyhood i was extraordinarily timid and bashful even after i had entered yale college when i could go home in the summer and my mother would call me in to meet her friends i was so frightened that when i thought i spoke i did not make an audible sound when her friends had gone my mother would say why didn't you say something to them and i would reply that i supposed i had but my mother would say you did not utter a sound think of a young fellow like that entering the ministry i never mustered courage enough to speak in a public prayer meeting until after i was in the theological seminary then i felt if i was to enter the ministry i must be able to at least speak in a prayer meeting i learned a little piece by heart to say but when the hour came i forgot much of it in my terror at the critical moment i grasped the back of the settee in front of me and pulled myself hurriedly to my feet and held on to the settee one niagara seemed to be going up one side and another down another my voice faltered i repeated as much as i could remember and sat down think of a man like that entering the ministry in the early days of my ministry i would write my sermons out in full and commit them to memory stand up and twist a button until i had repeated it off as best i could and would then sink back into the pulpit chair with a sense of relief that it was over for another week i cannot tell you what i suffered in those early days of my ministry but the glad day came when i came to know the holy spirit as the paraclete when the thought got possession of me that when i stood up to preach there was another who stood by my side that while the audience saw me god saw him and that the responsibility was all upon him and that he was abundantly able to meet it and to care for it all and that all i had to do was to stand back as far out of sight as possible and let him do the work i have no dread of preaching now preaching is the greatest joy of my life and sometimes when i stand up to speak and realize that he is there that all the responsibility is upon him 
such a joy fills my heart that i can scarce restrain myself from shouting and leaping he is just as ready to help us in all our work in all our sunday school classes in all our personal work and in every other line of christian effort many hesitate to speak to others about accepting christ they are afraid they will not say the right thing they fear that they will do more harm than they will do good you certainly will do if you do it but if you will just believe in the paraclete and trust him to say it and to say it in his way you will never do harm but always good it may seem at the time that you have accomplished nothing but perhaps years after you will find out that you accomplished much and even if you do not find it out in this world you will find it out in eternity there are many ways in which the paraclete stands by us and helps us of which we will speak at length when we come to the study of his work he stands by us when we pray romans chapter eight verses twenty six and twenty seven when we study the word john chapter fourteen verse twenty six and chapter sixteen verses twelve and fourteen when we do personal work acts chapter eight verse twenty nine when we pray or teach first corinthians chapter two verse four when we are tempted romans chapter eight verse two when we leave this world acts chapter seven verses fifty four to sixty let us get this thought firmly fixed now and for all time that the holy spirit is one called to our side to take part ever present truest friend ever near thine aid to lend end of chapter five